Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the International Mentorship Program today. David Thomford is going to talk to us about pain management. Thank you, David. You're welcome, Kate. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so for Afiza and Regina, these are some areas that we touched on when I was there in Guyana, but hopefully this will go a little bit more into detail. So to begin with just the idea of pain, and this is a definition from the International Association for the Study of Pain, um, unpleasant sensation, emotional expo experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. Um, the important things for me here are one thing is it can be either sensory or emotional. We tend to think of pain as strictly a, a sensory thing, but there are emotional components. And then the other thing is it can be actual or potential texture damage, something that's actually happened or something the person fears might happen. So that's the definition of pain we're using. And then I want to talk a little bit about my own experience. Um, as 30 years in the OT, I've often found pain to be a really difficult issue um, to deal with. And there are a lot of reasons for this. One reason is that um, people who are in pain don't want to move. You know, if your arm is hurting, you, the therapist comes in and says, let's do some range of motion, let's do some activity. Your immediate reaction is to say, no, I don't want to do that. Um, one thing that means is that people have reduced motivation um, because they're really thinking about their pain. When you're really hurting, that's all you can think about. Another reason that pain is difficult, especially as an OT, is that um, people are used to going to a health professional and getting something like a pill or, or an injection that gives them fairly immediate relief. And when the OT says, well, I'll teach you some techniques, and after you learn these techniques, your pain will decrease, sometimes people are not so interested in that. Um, associated with the idea of, of decreased motivation is the fact that people guard a, a painful part. So again, they don't want to move, they don't want to be moved, or they want to be touched. And then finally, as OTs, so much of our work involves patient participation, patient involvement. And other health professionals, such as nurses, can give treatment to somebody who's pretty passive, but we need active patient participation. So if somebody's in pain, often they don't want to participate. Any questions? You know, Regina and Anfisa, you know me well enough to know that anytime you have a question or anytime you want to share an experience, please just jump in. Will do. Okay. So we talk about acute pain and we talk about chronic pain. Um, as, as according to this, this slide, acute pain is caused by a very specific disease or injury. Like if you cut yourself with a knife, it causes pain immediately. If you burn yourself, it causes pain immediately. Acute pain also serves a useful biological purpose. If you burn yourself on a stove, you, you, you pull your hand back and that there's painful and that prevents you from burning yourself further. Or it may teach you not to touch the stove in the future. Um, it's also associated with a very specific muscle spasm, such as pulling your hand back if you touch the stove. And also the other thing, um, some of these slides, some of the words may be covered up by the pictures, but it says that it's uh, time limited. So if you get an acute pain, you twist your ankle, over time the pain will go away by itself. Chronic pain, on the other hand, is they call it a disease state. Um, and usually they say it lasts more than six months beyond the normal healing period. So if you burn yourself and six months later, you're still having pain, that would be called chronic pain. And it can also arise from psychological states. So it's not necessarily just associated with some, uh, an injury, but it can be deal with the psychological state itself. It doesn't serve a biological purpose. Um, if you have back pain that's last for months and months, it's really not helping you. So acute pain, we're trying to treat the underlying cause. The person sprains their ankle. Um, we're trying to treat that ankle and we're trying to prevent the ankle from hurting. And we're trying to maybe interrupt the signals between the injury and the brain. Whereas chronic pain, we're talking more about a multidisciplinary approach, um, many, many different therapeutic uh, uh, modalities being involved. A little bit about chemistry behind pain. And this is a very complicated topic. 
So it's not much detail here, but it, you know, there are more things you can look into. Um, one thing to be aware of is that the pain, the, the brain has um, a system of natural opi opioids. These are related to morphine, related to heroin, but they're things that are secreted by the brain rather than being put into the body. And such things as physical exercise and laughter can stimulate the release of these, of, of these opioids. And these opioids bind with receptors in the pain pathway and they block the transmission or perception of pain. So for instance, um, they've done experiments and shown that if somebody is in a lot of pain and you show them a movie that causes them to laugh and causes them to enjoy themselves, that can actually decrease the, uh, the, the uh, pain signals from getting to the brain. And OTs have a <coughs> important role here because we can prescribe different activities, you know, physical activity, exercise, or something the person enjoys doing, which can stimulate the release of these opioids. So that's one way we can, we can help control pain. <coughs> the other element involved in pain is what's called the gate control theory. And this is, again, really, really complicated. There's a lot of research done to it. What I'm giving you here is just a very uh, simple summary. But it basically says that between the place where the pain starts, like if you cut your finger, the end of your finger, and your brain, there are what they call gates. And these are, um, you know, not obviously not physical gates. They're um, uh, some sort of neurological mechanism that that blocks the pain stimulus from reaching the central nervous system. And some research has shown that if you stimulate the, the part of the body in other ways, it can sort of close the gate. So for instance, electrical stimulation is the most popular used one, but some, some people have shown that electrical stimulation applied to the body can block the uh, pain signal from going from the hand up to the brain. Um, heat or cold can, can do a similar thing. Sometimes rough, rough uh, rubbing of skin any sort of stimulation in some way can, can block one of these gates. Um, so one thing we can do as OTs is we can develop programs to try and block or reduce the pain. Any questions on these, Afiza or Regina? I know that these are really complicated. Um, there's plenty of information on the internet. Excuse me? Clear so far, clear so far. Okay. I'm good, okay. sir. Okay, okay, good. Uh, let's see. Let's talk about now how we as OTs assess for pain, because that, is, as, as you guys know from our evaluations that we worked on in Guyana, that's an important part of our initial OT assessment. Um, this will be review for you because these are things we talked about often when we were working in the clinic. Um, the first thing we do is we, we figure out what part of the body hurts. And we use a diagram like this to mark maybe shoulder pain, to mark maybe foot pain on the front of the body or on the back of the body. We also use a pain, pain rating scale and it can be a zero through 10. Um, you can ask the person to put their pain level on a zero to 10. You can observe their face and see what their face looks like and you can rate it that way. Um, one thing to be said is that as OTs, we like to use something like a goniometer which gives us a precise number to people who have elbow flexion at 50 degrees have the same elbow. Pain is different. One person's six out of 10 may not be the same level of pain as another person's six out of 10. Different people per uh, uh, perceive pain in different ways. So it, it is a very subjective thing. It, it's not so useful to compare one person to another person where it's most useful is to compare a person over time. So yesterday they, they perceived they had six out of 10 Today they have eight out of 10, got a problem here. The pain's increasing. So as I say, you can have them look at the faces, you can have them go by the uh, descriptions, or you can give them a line with zero at one end and 10 at the other end and ask them to draw a line where in that range their pain is. These are all different ways of assessing the pain. And here on the right are some different descriptive. Uh, it's, it's pretty small writing, but, but if you go to this, uh, website below, you can get more details about how uh, this pain can be described. You also need to talk about triggers. What causes the pain to occur? 
other than the simple the physical injury. It may be movement, it may be exposure to heat. There, there are different things. It may be like a spasm that can cause the pain to occur. We need to know about that. It's also useful to know how the pain feels. Is it a sharp pain, an aching pain, a cramping pain? Um, again, these, you know, one person's description might be different from another person's, but if we have a description, sometime we can get more idea about what's causing the pain. And then we also look at associated symptoms such as fever, edema, or redness that might be associated with the pain. Okay, I'll take a breath. I need to remind myself. So, one thing is doctors treat pain through medications. Um, at least here in the US, OTs do not prescribe. I think that's true in most countries. So OTs are not the ones who say, take this medication. But we have an important role to play. Um, one thing is to make sure the patient is taking the medication according to prescription. You can ask the patient, you know, what does the doctor prescribed? The, doc, the patient says two times, you know, pill two times a day. Is the patient taking that? And you can report to the doctor or the nurse or whoever prescribed the pill if there are problems with the prescription. And also you can communicate with the doctor about whether the prescription is effective and if there are any side effects because we're the one who sees the patient in, 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 a, in a more intimate situation. So we can communicate this with the doctor. We also can help the person either by prescribing or developing devices that help the person reminding. Um, I don't know about Guyana, but at this point, my patients I work with in the US, often they have 10 or 15 medications they're supposed to take. And it's really hard to keep track of all those. So there are different pill boxes you can get their electronic calendars, different ways to help the person take their medication according to schedule, different ways of reminding them. We also need to look at the person's physical and cognitive ability to handle the, pill, the, the pills, bottles, and things like that. Can they open their bottles? It's no sense getting a special medication if you can't open the bottle. There's no sense getting a, a prescription for uh, um, insulin shots if you can't use a syringe. So we need to assess what the person can do physically and cognitively, whether they can handle. And then we try and find some different adaptations of techniques to identify problems we had. Um, in terms of opening a bottle, you have to have two hands that can give a, a, a very much of a twisting motion, but there are devices you can use. You can put on top of the bottle, twist with your strong hand, hold with your weak hand, that will help you to open that bottle. Um, if you need to take half a pill, the pills are really small. It's really difficult to, to, to take get that pill in two. There are special pill slitter, pill slitter uh, boxes that you can get. Um, if you don't have access to one of those special boxes, another way is just take a knife, put it in the middle of the pill, hit, hit the pill, the knife with a hammer. Um, you may have to go and find the pill that's skittered around to the floor, but uh, you can you can break it that way. Um, crushers. Some people need some people need to take pills uh, in a crushed form, mixed up with applesauce or something like that. Again, there are special devices that crush pills, or you can put it in a bag, hit it with a hammer, and crush it that way. But anyway, we work with a patient. And what do they need to do to take their pills? How can we change it so they can take their pills, their medication? <coughs> if you have somebody <coughs> who is visually impaired. You can help them develop a system to know to distinguish between the different medicines. That could be a large print label. It could be a different number of bumps on the pill bottle so they know which one is which. But anyway, we help them. As said before, we also monitor the patient's reaction to medication. Um, we can share that information with a doctor and we can share that information with the PTs, the nurses, anybody working with them so they know how well the, the medications are working. Um, and then we can also advocate with the doctor and the patient for a medication schedule that keeps the pain from getting too extreme, especially with pretty powerful pills. Sometimes a patient may be uh, scared of getting addicted, so they may say, well, I'm not going to take this pill unless the pain is really, really, really strong. And what happens then is they wait until the pain is so strong they have to take an extra amount of pill to get rid of the pain, whereas if they can learn to... Uh, um, take the pill, 
before the, the medicine gets too strong, they can keep the, the uh, um, pain under control with less medication. Um, referral. Uh, we also need to be a person who, who uh, reports to a doctor how much pain there is. Um, I don't know about in, in your countries, but in my country, especially men, they go to the doctor and the doctor said, how are you doing? And the person's reaction is fine. They don't want to talk about pain. OTs see the person. We see the person putting their clothes on. We see the person doing activities. And we see how the pain is affecting them. We see that when they try and put their shirt on, they're really struggling because of pain in their shoulder. So we see that, whereas a nurse or physician may not see that. And we can report that to the doctor or, or the nurse, and uh, then they will have a better idea of how to treat the patient. And finally, um, we do have some uh, tools within our scope of practice, but if we find the pain is really not, really not being helped by what we do, we need to consult with the doctor or the nurses and suggest that they try something else, whether it be medication, whether it be acupuncture, whether it be physical therapy. Let's see. So that's talking about the role of the doctor in turn, the role of the OT in terms of actually giving medication. Any questions there? Victor, I see you've joined us. Uh, any questions from you? Any uh, experiences you'd like to share? Problems you've encountered? If not, I'll inter um, interpret. I, I have a question. Go ahead, yes. Before you continue, maybe you will get to the topic. Um, in a case where you have a patient, how would you, is there a way you can prove that a person is taking their pain or, or it's more of a psychological aspect as opposed to having real pain? Please restate that, Regina. Say that again. I have a patient that comes here. We've done, like you said earlier, if you do a set of things and, you can't, you, and it doesn't work, consult with the doctor. But in this case, I have a patient that comes, we, we've done several things, but they still come for pain. But I'm asking if there's a way you can prove it's psychological and not real, as far not as physical. I, as far as I know, there's no way of telling. There's no way of telling that, Regina. Um, okay. There may be some, you know, more complicated devices that show like a change in galvanic skin response or something like that. But as far as I know, there's nothing um, within our, our scope of practice that shows that. Kate, I don't know if you have, you have a suggestion there. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, no, I don't. But you know what? If you guys wouldn't mind taking yourselves off your camera for a minute, I'm going to take a picture. Just, I want to see your faces. Yeah, just for a second, if everyone doesn't mind. But you can keep going, David. OK. So now we'll talk about those, those are mainly dealing with acute pain. Medication is important, both acute pain and, and chronic pain. But with acute pain, it's, it's of primary significance. In chronic pain, uh, medication is just one element. Um, what happens when somebody has chronic pain is that they get disempowered. They begin to feel, um, I can't control life. This pain has taken over my life. I can't do things. Um, it leads to lower self-esteem. So what we do as OTs is we try to uh, find a self-management approach. What they call it, it's, it's, uh, um, it's uh, therapy addressing daily living activities. So what we do as OTs for chronic pain is we look at the different daily living activities, we look at the, th the activities the person values, and then we look at the person's goals. And so we try and say, how can their, their lifestyle, and it's called lifestyle therapy, how can their lifestyle be changed to reduce the amount of pain they're in? So here are a number of steps you can do. The first thing you do is you determine which activities bring on the pain, and then you teach the person some ways to do the same activity, but in such a way that it reduces the pain. But we also want to work on self-image because this person with a lot of chronic pain becomes um, depressed, they, they, they lose their sense of empowerment. 
they, they have a poor self-image. Um, and we want to teach them to regain a positive self-image, a positive control. And the way we do that is through our carefully graded activities. Just as you're teaching somebody to get stronger, you, you start with something they can do so they can make progress. They can you know, use a, a, a weight uh, to get stronger and stronger as they go along. In the same way with somebody with chronic pain, you start with something they can achieve. And then you make it gradually more and more difficult so they're improving, but still with things they can achieve. And again, written here, it's the total lifestyle package. It's called lifestyle-based intervention. How, the, how can the person change their lives in a way it reduces or controls their pain? This is just a list of some different kinds of pain. We'll talk about some specifically later on. You can have migraine, tension, or headaches, muscular skeletal pain, pain associated with burns, with progressive diseases, neurological conditions, complex regional pain syndrome, and phantom limb pain. And we'll talk about some of these later on. Um, some of these are more of a you know, general treatment, but there are some that very, have some very specific treatment involved. We also need to consider some aspects other than just the pain itself. So some cognitive or behavioral aspects. We need to talk about their medication usage, specifically what drugs they take, their schedules, and whether they can administer the medications. We already talked about that earlier, uh, whether the person can remember to take their pills on time, whether they can handle a syringe, whether they can <coughs> split the pills if they need to, and then some of their behaviors in response to pain. Um, you know, how do they, how do they deal? Do they, do they guard? Do they not move at all? How do they respond to having the pain? We want to look at uh, effective or emotional aspects such as depression or anxiety they may have from the pain. We want to look at their impact on function, um, their impact on the daily living, their impact on, on work, their ability to work, whether they can be a productive member of society, and then some of the social, social cultural aspects, such as whether they can be independent, whether they can be a productive family member, their impact on quality of life, and their impact on their goals. Any questions here, Regina, Victor, Afiza? We okay? If not, you, know, you don't need to say so. Keep on going. Was that a question, Regina? I'm good. Okay. Okay. No, no question. No question right now. So now we'll talk more specifically about things that OTs can do to help control pain or reduce pain. And many of these things are things that you've talked about in other, other areas um, that we teach people in general, but they can also help reduce pain. So we, we work with body mechanics. We, we teach the people to avoid body motions, positions that cause strain. Um, such as standing for long periods of time. Standing for a long period of time can put a lot of stress on the legs, make your feet painful. So you teach the person to sit down. You teach the person to sit erect with the pel anterior pelvic tilt. I don't know if the anterior pelvic tilt is something you, you, you've worked on, but a lot of people, they tend to sit back in a chair and they slouch back. And what that means is the pelvis tilts back against the chair. They're sort of rounded back. Whereas a person can sit forward straight up, their pelvis is vertical, and that is a much better position to avoid pain. We also teach people to use the larger joints. Smaller joints are more affected by pain, the larger joints are tougher. Uh, you know, basic back school, uh, lifting with your knees rather than your back, pushing with your whole body with your arms. If you're carrying a bag but with shopping, if you hold in your fingers, that can cause a lot more pain. If you could put it on your wrist, that would be less pain. And avoiding a sustained grasp, supporting items, like uh, if you have a book rather than holding your hands, placing it on a table. And these are all things that, could, that can reduce pain if somebody's having pain from arthritis. <coughs> then there are home changes just to make life easier, uh, reduce stress on the body, reducing pain, such as having tables at a waist height, um, and supplies at waist height so the person doesn't have to lean over or they don't have to reach too hard. Energy conservation and pacing. 
We've talked about that in, in other courses, but, but if you teach the person to rest between tasks, that may reduce the pain. If you have the person, if they have some difficult or painful tasks they need to during the day, have them do them on different times of day, rest in between, different days. We can do some splinting. Um, if a person has a weak wrist or a painful wrist, just putting a splint on their hand to, to, to stabilize the wrist during the night will keep it from twisting, keep it from getting in an uncomfortable position, a wrist cock-up splint. And we've already talked in previous sessions how if you don't have access to a, uh, to a, uh, you know, uh, a high, high temperature plastic splint, um, just taking a board, putting on the hand, fastening the board onto the hand just to keep the, the, the wrist from getting in a strange bent position at night can be helpful to reduce pain. <coughs> then there's some adaptive equipment. Um, we can talk about back braces. Um, we as OTs do not usually prescribe back braces, but we also have to teach the person how to put it on in such a way that's, that's less painful or teach the family how to put it on. A lumbar roll, which is simply a towel that's rolled up in a tube and you take something like tape, fasten it around it to hold it in tube and then put it right in the middle of the back. And that can uh, put the spine in a more comfortable position. We can also teach some uh, way to identify some abnormal postures that may cause pain. For instance, if the person hikes up their shoulder to reach because they found they have a lot of shoulder pain, teach them to relax, to keep their shoulder in, in a more relaxed position. Or if a person has a lot of pain when they clenching their teeth, that can result in jaw pain. So again, we can teach the person to relax and say, okay, you know, if you relax, then your pain will get less. And then relaxation techniques in general. All these ways are ways of relaxing the body and relaxing the body often will ease the pain. So deep breathing, breathing through the abdomen rather than through the chest. You know, I, we, we talked about this in our class with Fisa and, and Regina, but having the person lie down, putting like a brick on their stomach and practicing breathing in, breathing out and watch that brick going up and down. That will increase the deep breathing and help the person to relax. Different kinds of meditation. It can be a formal meditation class. It can be simply trying to empty your mind of things that are disturbing. That can help reduce pain, especially some of the chronic pain. Guided imagery, thinking of a place, thinking of a place, maybe a place you were as a child, thinking of how it smelled, thinking of how it looked, just having this peaceful image in your mind can help reduce the pain. Sequential muscle relaxation, you have the person lying down, they start tensing up their ankles, relax, tensing up their knees, relax, tensing up their hips, relax, tensing up their chest, relax, as a way of relaxing the whole body. Compression. Um, I think we've talked with some of you about how if a person has, a, a child has autism, you use a thunder shirt, which is a heavy a shirt with, with weights sewn into it, which, and, and then fastens tightly, and that compression can help a child with autism relax. The same can be done with pain and especially with the stress associated with pain. You can help the person get in something that's tighter and that can help relax. And then massage. OTs, some places OTs do a lot of massage, a lot of places they don't. But if you are somebody who has access to the skills of massage, that can help reduce the pain. And then this is primarily for somebody who has uh, chronic pain assertiveness training because often somebody who has a lot of pain they lose this feeling of self-control um, so whatever happens they accept and by teaching the person to say no to express their desires and express their needs clearly they can regain a sense of self-awareness a sense of self-empowerment um, and that can reduce the stress in their life um, they no longer feel as if they're being sort of batted back and forth by different people um, and that can reduce the pain. And then finally, working with a patient about scheduling medication. So the doses are, the pain is reduced when the patient must perform difficult tasks. I think we already do that when we tell a person, you're coming in for therapy at 11 o'clock, take your pain medication at 10 o'clock. Then when you come in, 
the pain is less and we can do some activities. Whew, deep breath here. <clears throat> So again, some general pain control techniques. One, as we've already talked about, is distraction. If a person is in a lot of pain, but they enjoy playing cards and you can get them involved in a card game, you can get them involved playing poker where their focus is on playing, getting from that game, the, the, the feeling of pain will, will diminish. Um, singing, watching comedy, doing puzzles, anything that, that, that helps somebody um, get distracted from their pain often will help to reduce the pain. And again, as we said, the assertiveness training will reduce the stress that comes from feeling that, the, that you're being controlled by everybody and that can, can reduce the pain, the chronic pain. Other modalities, physical modalities. Um, most OTs will use thermal modalities. We use heat or cold. One thing to be said is that there is an individual preference. I've worked with clients who say that heat really helps them. I've worked with other clients that say, no, heat doesn't help at all. The cold really helps them. So you need to talk with the client about what, whether heat or cold helps them more in terms of reducing their pain. If they're using heat, um, an electric pad, a rice bag, that's uh, a bag filled with rice that heated a microwave, moist heat of cloth wrapped in soaked in hot water. All these are ways of applying heat to a painful area that, that may reduce the pain. One thing you may not think about is neutral warmth. Um, an, a part of the body that, that is um, uh, exposed to the air will lose heat just by that process. If you can wrap the painful area in a towel, that will keep the heat in. It's a very gentle heat, but often it will help to reduce pain. <coughs> If the person does prefer, prefer cold, you can, you can get a plastic bag and put ice in it. Um, I've, I've had patients who have said that a, a package of frozen peas was very nice because that will mold very nicely to the person area of pain rather than ice cubes that don't, don't mold so well. Otherwise you can put ice and, and, and water, ice and water and the person can put their, their part in the water to reduce pain. Um, that is, the ice water is a very, very strong application of cold, so you have to be careful of that one. Um, one thing you do need to do to avoid using too much heat or cold on insensitive body part. If the person's had a stroke and they no longer have feeling in their hand, they can burn themselves badly if you apply too much pain. One way to approach that is to first put the, the um, heat or cold, the thermal modality on a sensitive part and then if they can manage there, then you can put on the insensitive part because you can cause bodily image. Um, you, it's also good to, to pad the part, to put a towel or some pads between the heat or the cold so it's not too hot or too cold. And then every country has local techniques. Um, there are different kinds of lotions that people use to apply heat, um, different kinds of medicines that are local medicines. So use, you can use whatever is, is locally available. So that's specifically heat or cold. Any questions, any comments, anything you'd like to share about your own experiences? Okay, there are, other, some, there are some other modalities. Um, at least here in the US, you, an OT needs to have a specific uh, um, training, specific certification to use these other modalities. Um, I don't know about your other countries, but things like ultrasound, electrical stimulation, paraffin, these are all ways that you can uh, uh, use modalities to reduce heat, to reduce pain, um, but they are more complicated and they take more, more specific training to, to learn how to use them and more specific equipment. Um, TNS, transcutaneous electro electrical nerve stimulation, it's similar to electrical stimulation. The only thing is in a clinic, Usually the person has a big machine, the therapist has a big machine. A TENS unit is a very small machine. The person can apply and they can walk around with this unit. But it's the same thing as an as a, a electrical stimulation machine that you, you put electrodes on the body, you put electricity in, um, and, and the 
according to the theory that activates this gate control and, and can block off the uh, uh, transmission of pain up to the brain. Now, at least in my experience, some people find this helpful. Some people say, ah, this feels so much better. I can feel that electrical stimulation. The pain is reduced. Other people just find it irritating. Other people say, this, this bothers me, I don't like it. So it does depend very much on the individual. We'll talk in more detail about mirror therapy for somebody who has Santum pain who's an amputee. Um, and then one other thing I want to stress is that using uh, pain reduction um, modalities in OT, our, 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 only, our only goal should not be just to reduce pain. We want to reduce pain so then the person can perform daily live activities, reduce pain so the person can walk better, reduce pain so the person can play cards, whatever. It should be, the, we need to have a goal other than simply reducing pain. So now we're getting into some specific part, some specific treatment. Um, we're gonna talk about phantom pain. Um, phantom pain is pain that occurs in a part of a body that's been amputated. So for instance, the person may have an amputation at the elbow and their fingers hurt. Um, for a long time, people thought this was all psychological. They thought it was all, in, at some point it was even thought to be mental illness. But now most research has shown that, that uh, the nervous system gets confused. The nervous system is confused because there's no longer any messages getting in from the hand. So it, uh, it fabricates input, and what it fabricates is pain. Um, this phantom pain does come and go. It's not a consistent thing. And it often affects the end of the amputated limb, such as the fingers or the toes. And different people describe it as shooting pain, stabbing pain, cramping, pins and needles, crushing, throbbing, or burning. Um, these descriptions make it sound like it's a very strong, strong problem, and it's true. Some people find phantom pain to be com complete, extremely debilitating. Risk factors, a person's more apt to have phantom pain if they had pain prior to amputation, and also if they have pain in the part of the limb that's left. And there are some different triggers that can bring on phantom pain, touch, sexual intercourse, urination, defecation. This is part of our role as OTs to figure out what the triggers are that bring on this pain. So what can we do? How can we treat this phantom pain? One thing is make sure the person knows it's normal. Um, if a person tells their family, my toes hurt, the family is gonna say, your toes got cut off, how can they hurt? Um, and so people often don't wanna talk about it because they're afraid somebody's gonna say they're crazy. So we need to really uh, convince the person this is normal, it's okay to talk about it, it's okay to tell us about it, we need to know about it, don't, don't hide it. There are medications that a doctor can prescribe. Um, acupuncture is found to be useful in some, in some patients. These aren't things that OTs would do, but these are some treatments. Um, massage, um, massage may be, may be useful. And then um, uh, using a stump shrinker, which is one of those stock, socks that goes over the end of a, of a, a residual limb. Um, its, its main use is to allow a prosthesis to fit firmly onto a residual limb, but simply having this stump shrinker, which is applying pressure on the end of the residual, residual limb, uh, will reduce pain to some degree. Repositioning. This is a very much of an individual thing. Some people find it most more comfortable when the, when the residual limb is on the pillow. Other people don't. You need to figure out what the most comfortable position is. The TENS unit we already talked about can be useful for reducing pain and residual, in a reducing, redu, excuse me, reducing phantom pain. Um, res, virtual reality therapy. Here we're getting pretty high tech, but some research has shown that if they put electrodes onto the end of a visual limb and apply electricity, it can somehow stimulate the normal sensation in the missing limb and reduce phantom pain mental imagery, and, and some of our, our relaxation techniques and all the help there too. 
Now let's talk about mirror box therapy. This is something that's, that's been proved quite effective to reduce phantom pain. So we'll have some pictures later on uh, in the next slide, but for somebody who has a lower extremity amputation, you put a, a mirror between their legs. If they have an upper extremity amputation, you make a box, a square box. You put a hole in the front of it for the person to put their hand through, their, their amputated hand, and then the side would have a mirror on it. So the person puts their hand into the box and so they can't see their hand and they put their good hand um, next to the mirror. So when they look at the mirror, they see their strong hand and they see the mirror reflection of their strong hand. So it appears as if they have two hands, both of them intact. Um, the most important thing is that um, the hand is, is hidden. Some people also have just put a mirror between the two hands and then like draped something over the, the uh, amputated hand. And then when the person has their hand in the box, you have the sound limb simply do exercises, activities, pick up things, and it gives the impression, it gives the brain the impression as if both hands are, do, are doing the activity. <coughs> what we recommend usually is 15 minutes three times a day. Um, that, of course, depends on the person's motivation. Sometimes they feel motivated to spend more time with it. And there are quite a few articles um, on the internet, YouTube uh, uh, videos and articles about how to do this. Um, here are some pictures. Here's that mirror box. Here's the sound hand and the person seeing the reflection. So it appears that both their hands are here, even though they have an amputated hand that's inside the box. Here's the same thing, simply using a mirror that's leaned up against. And again, they just to make sure, you need to make sure they can't see the, the amputated limb. This person has a mirror, has a lower extremity amputation. They put the mirror between their legs here. Um, and then you, you, you do need to make sure, to make sure the mirror is tilted so the person can actually see. Because from where this, this guy is, it's gonna be difficult seeing that mirror reflection. But you need to make sure you can. Here it's more specific. You can see they've tilted the mirror so the person's looking and they're seeing this foot and they're seeing the reflection in the mirror. So you're getting the impression that, that, that the amputated limb is doing the same thing. <coughs> Back pain. Back pain is something primarily OTs work with, but we can do some, some in, we can be involved to some degree. Uh, we already mentioned the lumbar roll to protect the lumbar curve. Um, spine exercises, flexion extension to help the person increase flexibility and strength. Walking, te uh, carrying techniques, lifting using the knee knees, uh, carrying weight close to the body. And log rolling techniques. Um, when people try and sit down, if they try and sit down straight in their bed, that can put a lot of stress on their back. If they roll over their side, and keep their keep their their back straight. That can be a less painful way of getting them out of bed. And then just a very little bit to say about fibromyalgia. Um, that is something that's gotten much more uh, of a problem in the United States. Um, <coughs> it's basically overall fatigue, widespread pain, and some very specific tender points. Um, these days, it's considered a, a, a rheumatic illness, um, an autoimmune illness um, that causes these, these body-wide um, this body-wide pain. And OTs would use the different techniques associated with chronic pain. Um, we already talked about adaptive techniques to, for activities that cause pain, relaxation, um, to improve self-control, <coughs> um, goal setting and training in body mechanics. Whew. I'll take a breath here. At the end here are some different references, some different information sources about different, different uh, things I've talked about that you can go and do more research on. <coughs> so with this information, Regina, Afiza, Victor, um, how can you use this? What are, do you have patients that are, have, have been in pain where you can apply some of this information? 
Victor has his hand raised. Go ahead and ask a question, Victor. You just have to take yourself off of mute. I can't hear you, Victor, because I, okay, there you go. Start again, Victor. Okay. Okay, do you get me now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, th um, yeah. Thank you so much for, 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 for the lesson. It's interesting. Uh, I've loved the mirror technique. I've loved the ice technique and the role using to try them out. I've been having, uh, I have a patient and the five years uh, on six months. Uh, right now, we're training we have uh, on walking in uh, Your words are coming and going, Victor. I'm not catching all your words. Muscles. I'm not hearing you right now. You know what, Victor? Do you want to type your question in the chat box below and then I'll read it to David because you're breaking up on us and he's not able to hear your question. You're Hello, uh, uh, do you get me now? I do get you now. Do you want to try and uh, say what the issue is again? If not, you can try and type it in. Because I think we lost you again. Okay, let me be, <coughs> let me, okay, let me try typing. Please. Okay. Any other questions while he's typing? I don't have any questions because, I don't know, probably because it's our David, we've been using um, most of what he talked about uh, in clinic, um, using the ADLs or um, different sort of activities, um, social activities, um, as well as the modalities, because we've been, we've been trained uh, to some extent to use um, the various modalities, TENS, M's, of course, um, uh, cryotherapy or heat therapy. So I, I don't really have any uh, question, but I do know that it has worked for uh, a number of my patients. Good, and, good, good. Um, as well as with like the paraffin wax, it, it really does wonders in terms of uh, hand function to help restore that, to decrease pain. So good. yeah, they work. <laughs> good, good, good. I'm glad to hear that. Although I don't use them on kids because that's what I see right now. Why is that? Why don't you use them on kids, Afisa? Um, the children I have right now don't require using any sort of modality. Okay. And um, most, because the cases I see are neurological. Uh, okay. The kids I see are neurological. And they don't, it, even if they do have pain, it's the younger ones. When I mean younger, I mean the six weeks to the four months. So they can't actually tell you verbally that I am feeling pain when you do this. It's yeah. just based on um, expression or how fussy they get and you compare the times that you do the same thing. And at least for me, that is, that's how I, I, I make somewhat of an assumption that, you know, maybe they are feeling a little bit of pain today. Okay. I, I can see how it is difficult to use a lot of these techniques for somebody who can't express their pain. Yeah. <laughs> so do we have a question from Victor, Kate? Victor, I did not see, um, it didn't come to me or to everyone if you typed in the chat box. If you aren't successful with typing in at this point, Victor, my email address is on the uh, slideshow. You can always email me the question and I can answer specifically for you.
Okay. Um, also, when I send out the, um, the recording, I'm now, I do have an open educational resource page where all of the videos are posted. And there's also, I started a page of all free assessments for pediatrics. And then um, I've been getting from colleagues some other um, free assessments for mental health and for FISDIS settings. So I will post um, when I send out the next recording, I will post that link so that you can um, use that site for free resources. Uh, I have been asked about um, integrating primitive reflexes. So there is something on there as well. Um, and if you have anything that you think that I should add, please um, email me and I'll add it to the site. There is a free developmental screenings uh, that was de developed at Tufts University and there is um, free developmental monitoring uh, as well on the site developed by the CDC. So there are some free tools on there on the Open Educational Resource page, in addition to all the um, recordings that we've done. Any other questions before we finish up for today? All right, well, please email David if you have any questions, he'd be happy to follow up. And thank you so much, David, for coming. This was great. Okay, good to, to, to talk with both of you again, Regina and Afiza. And also you, you Victor, um, we didn't have much chance to communicate, but I hope we'll communicate more in the future. Sure, sir, David. Thank you very much. Enjoy the presentation. Okay. Uh, if I have any questions as they come up, I'll message you. Um, what I found interesting, it was the mention of massages because, you know, over here, they, um, in our physio department, they, they don't want us to do the massaging. So you having mentioning that to help, I can actually okay. use it now, you know. Okay, that it it, it depends very much on on the country and, and on, what, uh -huh. on what specifically you know. I I don't right. I'm not sure Guyana has has specific rules at this point about what OT is and what PT is. So you well, can true. that's that. true. That's true. Yeah, so it's just like a, a a general Tom rule basically. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So yeah, that's it. Thank okay. you. Okay. Talk to bye you bye. Later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.